Um, good morning, everybody. I'd like to give you all, all a warm welcome, uh, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this EPC uh, policy dialogue um, called Decoding Russia-Turkey Relations. Russia and Turkey have got a very long history of turbulent uh, relations. Um, I would say they've locked horns on numerous occasions over the centuries, but there's also been moments of very closeness usually when Turkey is at odds or feeling let down by the West. <clears throat> I would also say that um, President Putin and Erdogan um, also now have a very long history of working together. I mean, they're both being in power, um, let's say around two decades, um, and they both seem to have a common goal of wanting to stay in power um, forever, or as long as possible, I could say. I think generally speaking, over the last 10 years or so, Moscow and Ankara, have managed to get on quite well, um, with the exception of Turkey shooting down uh, the Russian jet at the end of 2015, when all hell broke loose. And this relationship was only restored after President Erdogan exceptionally apologized uh, to President Putin. Personally, I wouldn't call it a strategic partnership, um, but rather a sort of on and off transactional or compartmentalized relationship. Um, while Turkey and Russia have many competing goals, they still manage to rub along and accommodate each other. Um, I would say also the relationship has proved to be quite durable, um, although sometimes it has involved uncomfortable trade-offs uh, for both parties, particularly I would say in Syria, but not only. Now our guests today um, are going to engage in a conversation about the complex Turkey-Russia um, relationship. And I'm really delighted to have with us two really good um, and well-known experts. Um, first of all, um, Asla Aydin Tashbash, who's a senior policy fellow at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Um, welcome to you, Asla. I think it's the first time you've ever came to the EPC, so I'm delighted uh, to have you here. I am. Um, and then from Moscow, um, Maxim Suchko, senior fellow and associate professor at the Moscow State Institute of international um, relations. Welcome to you, Max. This is not Thank the you. first time, so um, welcome back. Just before we start the discussion, I would just like to give a few housekeeping rules, like always. I hope you're going to have a lot of questions to the audience. Um, we had more than 200 people sign up for this event. Um, if you would like to ask a question, there's two ways of doing this. Um, you can either type it into the dialog box um, at the bottom of the screen, or alternatively, you can click on the hand icon and then you can um, give your question verbally. I think there's lots of issues to talk about, so I'm looking forward to putting across all of your questions. Now, I would like to start off by putting um, one question to both um, Asla and to Max, um, and it would be this. Um, I would like to ask you both how you view the drivers and dynamics in, in Turkey-Russia relations, generally speaking, how it has evolved over the last few years and why, and what are the main characteristics? What uh, is the main goal um, of Russia and of Turkey? Um, maybe we can start with you, Asla. Um, well, uh, thank you, Amanda, and uh, thank you for uh, this for inviting me for this very important conversation. I do think that the relationship is little understood in the West. Uh, the fact that Turkey and Russia under have created what is a, a relationship based on both cooperation and competition is anathema, I think, to many of the uh, standards and benchmarks and alliances that have been uh, that have been that have been part of the Western liberal order, where you're either friends or not friends. But this situation, whereby the two countries have both deployed troops in Syria, Libya, and the Caucasus, sometimes often on the uh, on the on the uh, opposite sides of the conflict, but have somehow managed to work it out, is has been a very interesting experience. I think, uh, as for as for the main drivers, they uh, I think with synchronized troop deployments. It seems to me that Turkey and, and, and Russia have, uh, first of all, filled a strategic vacuum uh, left by Europe and the United States in these theaters, uh, Libya for sure, Syria for sure, and in a sense, the Caucasus as well. 
uh, marked by you know cooperation and competition I, secondly they turkey and russia are encouraging and emboldening each other's uh, revisionist uh, instincts research their resurgent powers who want uh, their place under the sun in the global order and feel that they deserve more and by working together uh, by coordinating albeit on different sides of the conflict, they were able to create uh, their own di divergent spheres of influence. And uh, let me remind you that Turkey's return to the Middle East, which at this point is an important component of Erdogan's foreign policy and, and also uh, you know, a public platform, it's been enabled by Russia, by the Russian green light for Turkish incursions in Syria. So that seems very important. And I think, let's not forget, they've created this, an, an art form of uh, the, the, the expression, we agree to disagree. It's not very, it's not been uh, extremely uh, comfortable for bureaucracy, I think, on either side. But in Libya, in uh, Syria, and uh, in the Caucasus, this is what we see. So, but uh, others have pointed out that this relationship is not institutional. It's not. It really rests on the chemistry between Erdogan and Putin, is not, and is not really um, is not really has not seeped into their respective establishments. But I, I think that uh, I wouldn't call it a strategic alignment, uh, a permanent strategic alignment, but I would think of it as a, a lasting partnership because it seems that both sides want to see a strategic interest in continuing this relationship. For Erdogan, it's often a, le a leverage with West or, or, uh, or at times actually uh, allowing policies that expand Turkey's footprint in the Middle East. Uh, for Putin, it's, you know, I will leave that to Maxim, but much has been said that, you know, Russia is driving a wedge uh, between, uh, within the NATO alliance. But the, the reality is that they both seem to drive a benefit from this partnership. Now, I think that there will be challenges ahead for in 2021. I'll briefly touch upon these. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the West and in particular, the US has always been an invisible third side in this relationship, how Turkey's relationship with the US fares has been important. And I think that the same imperatives that led Turkey to a partnership with Russia back several years ago are now there uh, pushing Turkey towards uh, an improved relations with, uh, its, with, it, with, it, with its Western uh, partners, in particular, United States. I think that there's a desire for a reset, for a course correction, improved ties with the Biden administration. There's an understanding that put, uh, Trump is no longer there, and therefore there is need for a course correction. Direction. You only need to look at uh, Turkish defense chief Hulusi Akar's interview yesterday, speaking of alternative arrangements, perhaps keeping S 400s in, uh, in storage. All of these things signal that now uh, Turkish Russian relationship will also be defined on what happens between Turkey and Washington. Um, I think that uh, another challenge will be for Turkey not to get caught up in the policy debate within the Biden administration on Russia, because no doubt there will be uh, Russia hawks uh, wanting a more assertive uh, position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, what they see as Russian expansionism and those that are, and the realists that are uh, uh, arguing for some type of a, a re, you know, not a reset that's ruled out, but some type of a modus vivendi. And I think that Turkey will be part of that discussion. Turkey's main sales pitch when it goes to Washington to for, for a reset and improve ties is that we are pushing back against Russia uh, in the Caucasus, in Libya, in Syria. And I think that is uh, an appealing and appetizing notion for American policymakers, but it's also a dangerous one for Turkey. And I think number three, uh, as a third challenge, um, you know, uh, I will talk about uh, perhaps Syria. Uh, the current status quo with 
people having different spheres of influence and territory, essentially a patchwork, is uh, sustainable for a bit longer. But unlike others, uh, and unlike others, I don't see uh, as for hundreds or Idlib as insurmountable issues in the Turkish-Russian relationship. But I do think that ultimately there will be a, a, a push, a need for a conversation between United States and Russia and Syria. Uh, you know, with the understanding that uh, the Biden administration is not going to push for regime change. I think that policy seems bankrupt, but sooner or later down the road, there will be a desire to, to sort of uh, close this file. And I think that will be very interesting for Turkey, whether it will be in that trilateral conversation or not. Uh, just my final comments in that conversation, let's not forget the fact that once the idea of regime change is off the table, Russians and Americans do not have wildly uh, different notions of what role Kurds should have in Syria. In that conversation, there will also be a, a discussion on a role for Kurds in a decentralized uh, Syria. And I think that will be a huge challenge for Turkey to come to grips, whether it, it you know, whether it can, Turkey has had different periods in its relationship with Kurds, with obviously it's part of the domestic story also, but, you know, but, but managing the uh, a potential Syria uh, uh, rapprochement between United States and Russia and de uh, and coming to terms with a situation in which Kurds will also play a role in Syria, I think will be a, a significant uh, component of the uh, of this three way relationship. Thank you very much, um, Asla. Just before I move on to Max, I would just like to ask you a quick additional question. I mean, amongst Turkey's um, political elite, do you have um, circles of or groups who are particularly pro-Russian, um, as exists in some other countries, or or not, um, or partially? Well, there is uh, there is a, a good deal of frustration and anger at, directed at United States for their perceived role in the uh, failed uh, coup attempt of 2016. Having said that, uh, I think that um, there is more of a sober uh, assessment of Russia and what it means to be dancing with Russia compared to 2016. So the romance is starting to wear off. And uh, I would, and the relationship is also still not institutional, not part of the institutional structures that uh, unlike the relationship with the United States. Uh, the political parties that advocate a closer relationship or a pivot to Eurasia are very slim. So I, th I would say overarching sentiment within the body politic in Turkey is still for uh, Turkey's place in the West a resurgent Turkey, a more non-aligned Turkey, a nationalist Turkey, all of that, but not a pivot to Russia. There are political actors and those within the bureaucracy that advocate a pivot to Eurasia, but I, my sense is that that's still a very much of a minority opinion. That's not to say everybody is a transatlanticist. Again, I would like to underline the depth of the frustration uh, with the US and uh, because of uh, you know, the situation in Syria, but also 2016 coup attempt. But uh, if anything, I think Turkish, the, the, the dominant view now is that Turkey should have a foot in each camp, should be able to leverage, hedge its bed, uh, uh, but not, but, but, but somehow fix its relations with the West. I see more and more of a desire for, uh, for a reset or a, a, a sort of a course correction on that, both with Europe and United States. Thanks, Asla. This this was great. Um, now I'll turn the floor over to you, Max, to you know ask you the same original question: How you view the dynamic and prospects in 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 Turkey, um, Russia re Russia relations? Right. You have some slides. That's a very nice picture that are coming up. 
Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be with you and mindful of the time limits we have. Uh, let me just quickly go through the edit slides. I did not expect uh, I mean, us to be uh, have this, uh, this little time, but I'll, I'll manage to, to squeeze it in. Uh, a few things, actually. Nothing I disagree uh, about in and, and what Asla said, so I really thank you for, for the very interesting thoughts and presentation. Uh, few kind of things that I believe are important and frequently overlooked. Uh, beyond that, you know, Russia and Turkey are both ambitious powers and are with energetic leaders, uh, not shining away from using force and stuff uh, with their historic adversaries. Everybody knows that. One thing that, that I believe is important that actually for Russia and Turkey and for Turkey and Russia, uh, this is a very quote unquote comfortable uh, rivalry in the sense that it allows a lot of maneuvering within this rivalry between the two parties without fear that they will be punished for their actions targeting each other. You know, So for instance, if Russia did something, uh, well, say if, 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 if Russia downed a, I don't know, uh, God forbid a, a Lithuanian or Estonian or any other jet, over the skies of the Baltics, there will be tremendous repercussions for Russia, uh, for sanctions and other stuff. That that was not the case when when Turkey down the Russian plane. You know, nobody and and then Russia uh, retaliated by killing uh, some of the Turkish military. So my argument here is that Russia and Turkey can allow uh, to do a reasonable amounts of harm to each other without fearing that they will face repercussions for third parties for their actions. So in this sense, this is a very again, quote unquote, comfortable uh, rivalry for both. As to what the drivers of the relationship are, I, I personally single out five of them. Uh, principles, personal relationship, expectations, channels of communication, and the so-called grand idea. I have this uh, caricature of, of the British caricature of 1893, uh, I think that the kind of uh, comically shows how Russia is trying to squeeze Turkey over this dispute over these holy places. Today, this caricature may be interpreted in a different manner uh, as if, you know, Russia and Turkey are trying to cuddle together against, against the West. I think the three principles that Russia executes in in relation to Turkey after actually those were designed after this stress test of of the down jet in November 2015 is that it tries to treat issues that are very important to Turkey, uh, uh, Turkish security with understanding and more importantly with dignity. You know, Asla uh, accurately mentioned that there is no institutional uh, relationship between Russia and Turkey, and I totally agree. But I think one of the important elements in the Russia-Turkey relations that both countries actually host quote unquote, a European and an Asian identities. So, you know, for a, for a Western identity, it, it is important to have some institutional relationship, whereas for this quote unquote, a Asian identity, right? Or Oriental identity, uh, personal relationship, issues of dignity, you know, things that you can do together, you know, the relationship may not be institutional, but you sit together, you talk and you come up uh, with a solution that works fine, you know, as long as it gets us through, uh, we're happy with that. That'll, then though I agree in the long run, it's not very, maybe not very sustainable. The second principle, I think it, uh, both have learned over the course of the years to accurately establish some of the red lines that they don't want to cross. And there, if you look at it beyond this uh, military incident, I think uh, in 20, 2020, in April, 2020, uh, when a Russian military killed a few uh, Turkish soldiers and, you know, but you know, they agreed kind that of, it was Syrian military and then the Turkish military retaliated against the Syrians and beyond the down jet, uh, uh, the Russian jet in 2015, there were no major military clashes between the two, uh, the two countries. So I think these red lines have been uh, observed pretty, pretty much over the past of the few years. And, and the third principle is that Russia definitely takes advantages of some of the mistakes of Turkey's other uh, partners, especially the United States. The personal component is big. I'm not going to focus I mean, much on it. I think everybody pretty much understands what that is. I would only mention that both Putin and Erdogan seek greater de-Westernization of the international system, not so much because they hate the West or you know some 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 something of this kind, but rather because they were not able to 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 strike quote unquote a good deal with the West because both Putin and Erdogan have been seeking this partnership with Western institutions, be it the Europeans or Americans, uh, ever since they came to power in, er in, in early 2000s. And that didn't really work well. So both kind of came up to the, came, came to the idea that, you know, this kind of independent in, in nationalism 
where the West plays lesser role in the international system is actually better for their country's interests. The, the third component uh, is just the, the, the expectations. Uh, unlike Westerners, Russia does not have high expectations of Turkey, and I think the other way, the otherwise is true. And Asla mentioned that a little bit, I think. Uh, Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, once remarked that for the United States, Turkey is an ally, but not a partner. Uh, and it's pretty understandable from the American perspective. I think for Russia, Turkey is a partner, but not an ally. So you don't really expect Turkey to behave in an allied manner, but as a partner, it is important and you, know, you, you can do stuff together. So I think that element is also important. Finally, channels of communication, not gonna spend a lot of time on this either. Uh, pretty understandable in 2019, Erdogan was the number one foreign leader that Putin had most contacts with, obviously 2020 because of uh, the COVID uh, restrictions. And, and this year uh, is, is different, but Erdogan is definitely one of the a uh, handful of leaders in the world that Putin uh, spends most time with and actually seems to uh, like to be doing certain things and because they kind of operate in a similar uh, mindset in a similar paradigm. And the fourth component I think is actually the, the big one. Uh, the, I call it grand idea, you may call it different ways. I think it is the understanding that both uh, policymakers in Moscow and Ankara arrived to that the relationship between the two countries is actually beneficial to both, at least in the, in, 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 for now, uh, because Turkey has come to see, again, in my, in my view, uh, Russia as a resource to strengthen its own strategic sovereignty, from, including from the West. So this S-400 deal in this sense is, a, is important because it allows Ankara to uh, you know, strengthen its uh, military independent of, of the Western technology and Western uh, procedures. Uh, so Russia is in a way this kind of sovereignty enabler or strategic sovereignty enabler uh, 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 from, from, from Western dependence. Whereas for Russia, Turkey is a tool for increasing its own authority as a great power. Uh, and for both, as I mentioned, de-Westernization is, is a trend and both seem to be uh, following that trend. So, and it's not really clear for me what the grand idea for Turkey uh, there is out there from, from the West. You know, there was one uh, during the Cold War, Turkey was an important, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, ally in the, in the Southern flank. Uh, this is still the case in, in, in some of the conversation between Turkey and, and the NATO allies that Turkey says it, it puts some caps on the Russian expansionism. Uh, that is true, but it seems to me that there is no kind of grand idea that in, in, in even the NATO ally, uh, NATO commitments uh, do not seem to be enough to uh, meet expectations and appetites of the uh, contemporary Turkish uh, policy. Uh, making leadership. Uh, so Russia is in a way is jumping in this niche and exploiting this opportunity. But again, as, as I mentioned for, uh, for kind of in, 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 the, in the matter that uh, both seem to be uh, benefiting from. Uh, I'll stop perhaps here and uh, we're happy to uh, take your other comments or questions. Thanks, Maxim. Maybe I could just ask a quick follow-on question. I mean, you mentioned about these red lines um, that they have that they won't cross or don't try to cross, but is there a specific issue or something that could eventually arise which would seriously damage the partnership that's been created? I mean, what could, what could this be, for example? Well, I think... Uh... Most of the time for Russia in Turkey and for Putin and everyone, and everyone personally, it is something that damages their image and reputation within their domestic constituency. Uh, it may be the issue of prestige. It may be the issue of killing uh, military, uh, right? Obviously, perhaps, you know, the Syrian issue has a bigger uh, imp imp importance for uh kind of day-to-day -day operations of the Turkey, Turkish leadership and, and for perhaps for Turkish people because of refugees and other things. Uh, for Russia, most people are not really interested in, in even following the Syria campaign right now. But if there is a major incident that you know takes toll on the Russian military personnel or a, a, a jet or aircraft is down or something like that, 
that immediately kind of sparks criticism of what exactly are we doing in Syria and things like this. So I think something that really unsettles uh, political standing of both leaders inside the country is, is kind of a major uh, red line for, for both Putin and Erdogan, I would say. And that may happen anywhere in Syria and Libya Thank and you. Thanks, Thanks Mac. Okay, um, sorry, I think I, interrupt, I interrupted you there. No, no. Um, I, would, I would like to move now a bit to um, the, the region um, where Russia and Turkey are, are cooperating. And I would like to put you know, a question to you, Asla, now regarding the South Caucasus. I mean, Turkey's support for Azerbaijan during the Second Karabakh War, I mean, it was you know, unprecedented and represented a, a complete change of policy, if I could say, um, in Turkish. Um, foreign policy, or it seems to me, but it's also been been a geopolitical game changer um, for the for the region. Um, I mean, what are Turkey's ambitions um, and strategy now in the South Caucasus? Um, and a question to you, just to follow up, um, Matt. I mean, Russia has always been the most dominant actor in the, in the South Caucasus. I mean, it's a special you know region for the Russians um, for a very long time. Um, to what extent? Do you believe Turkey's, you know, increased um, role now in the region, you know, in, in Azerbaijan, obviously, um, is going to water down Russia's, you know, dominant position? And was Moscow, you know, um, was Moscow sort of prepared or, or was it sort of warned in advance um, of Turkey's policy towards, or Turkey's policy change uh, towards, towards the region? I mean, it's backing of Azerbaijan. I'll give the floor to you, Asla. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, I think it seems to me uh, the period of expanding Turkey's military footprint outside of its borders is over. It's reached its limits and uh, with the finally uh, what, what we've seen in the South Caucasus. Uh, and, and this, of course, was driven by uh, Azerbaijan's desire and uh, and with a green light from Russia in all, you know, in all three theaters, uh, there was a green, in all these three separate uh, theaters, there was a green light from Russia. In many ways, Russians have enabled, but also limited Turkey's uh, physical presence and military presence in Syria, uh, uh, Libya, uh, and the Caucasus. I think the current situation has, uh, Turkey at this point is looking at it as an interesting opportunity uh, in economic terms to increase trade with Azerbaijan and uh, the countries in the region. And uh, as an opportunity to manage its sort of relations with uh, with Russia, a testing ground. Uh, but uh, lately I have been hearing um, a suggestion from Turkish officials that they are now, uh, after three decades, open to and ready for an opening towards uh, Armenia. This is, of course, extremely good news. And if, uh, you know, I'm not sure that Armenia is, is ready for this because of uh, the loss of territory and the defeat uh, back in uh, November. But if at some point there could be some track for normalization on this front, whether it's opening the borders, starting trade, starting, you know, flights, whatever that may be, um, I think that would be a very uh, significant uh, issue not from a geostrategic level, but in terms of Turkey's relations with the West. So I think from this point on, I see Turkey's goals as essentially increasing trade, but also seek uh, 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 some type of a course of norm for normalization with the Armenia, uh, not so much for his uh, for a historic a need for historic reconciliation, uh, which unfortunately is not really. Uh, part of the political game here, but more because they, there's an understanding of what an impact it would have in Turkey's uh, you know, relations with uh, Europe or, the, or Washington. Uh... Thank you. Uh, Max? Yeah, you know, uh, the Karabakh was really, really interesting. And all of a sudden, I mean, it was a great uh, human tragedy in the sense that many lives were lost. But for analysts and policy, for analysts, it's, uh, it suddenly became a very interesting issue uh, once again after almost 30 years. 
uh, well, for policymakers, especially in Moscow, it came to be a huge concern. So just to give you a sense of what uh, the sense in, in Moscow in the fall of, of last year was regarding Karabakh, uh, all of the options uh, when Azerbaijan uh, started launching its offensive with a, with a massive Turkish uh, support, uh, military and political support, uh, made Russia kind of look around the options that it had and, and learn that all of the options on the table were pretty terrible. Uh, and Russia had a, a number of challenges so it, it, it needed to deal with to bring them together to, to, to a certain point of a decision on how to deal uh, with this issue. So uh, what, 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 what kind of tasks did Russia face at, at one time? So it needed to strengthen its own authority in the region right? And not to get involved in another hot conflict near its borders, uh, to support an ally, meaning Armenia, but avoid an expulsion and avoid expulsion of the Armenian community from Karabakh, not to push Azerbaijan away so as to prevent it from uh, repeating the Georgia scenario, you know, of 2008, uh, to prevent an unconditional victory of Baku at the same time, uh, because the idea was that because Armenia won in early uh, 1990s and late 1980s, uh, its uh, leadership was reluctant to uh, make any concessions. So it was important to make sure that there is no kind of unconditional victory for Baku at the same time. Uh, to prevent an increase uh, in the influence of the West, right, of the French or of the Americans, and to prevent the strengthening of Turkey but also at the same time, not to spoil relations with Ankara terribly. So this seems to be, you know, all kinds of divergent friends coming, coming from all angles. Uh, and this idea to, uh, but at the same time, it, it the basically there was no brilliant solution at the table. So the idea was to make sure that Russia can first and foremost retain strategic initiative in regional affairs and strengthen its presence, right? So basically we don't know how to settle these issues, but it's important that we retain the initiative to make sure that others don't come there with their own set of initiatives, right? That actually did not, uh, well, it was, was a problem in, in Russia's relation with Turkey, with Iran. Iran wasn't really happy about this uh, attitude and, and obviously some of the Western nations. So there was no specific options for combining all of these objectives into a particular solution. Uh, so kind of near optimal solution was found eventually by with this kind of deployment of Russian peacekeepers in Karabakh and Moscow acting as a key guarantor in the peace process uh, you know, and kind of in, in an agreement, but, but then having all kinds of other agreements with Turkey outside the formal agreement uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So to keep Armenians happy, but also, you know, Turks not alienated. So I thought it was a very, very uh, complicated and, and serious challenge at that time that for now, again, I'm, I'm talking about uh, what do we have, February 10th, 2029 seems to be a uh, uh, working pretty okay for, for all parties. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen next, uh, whether, you know, there might be some clashes, how this uh, yet another uh, channel between Russia and Turkey is going to work uh, in the future. But but for now, it, I, I believe it was a, a, the best solution that Moscow could, get, could, could have negotiated at that time. But is there a possibility that, you know, Turkey's um, increased ties with Azerbaijan will erode, um, let's say, the influence that Russia has had for a long period of time in the country. I mean, many Russian, let's say, Russian pro-Russians were removed from the Azerbaijani, you know, military military establishment. Turks were, were sort of put in there as trainers and whatnot. I mean, is there a risk that Azerbaijan can become, you know, too influenced by um, Turkey at the at the cost to, to Russia, or that's how it could be perceived by Moscow, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Uh, well, a few things actually. I think Azerbaijan's relations with Turkey uh, has been growing cozy ever since the breakup of the Soviet Union, and that's the the kind of the way that the relationship was going to. In any case, for now, uh, I think well, and definitely these kind of concerns are present in the Russian across the Russian policymaking 
community and the expert community and many people fear that's exactly what's going to happen, especially when you see all these images, you know, of Azeris celebrating uh, their victory with Turkish flags and Azeri flags all over the place and Israeli flags uh, for, in that sense as well. Uh, but I, what, what makes, I think, the Russian leadership, uh, well, I wouldn't say confident, but perhaps more positive that it's not the, the way where the relationship is going to go is that it thinks that uh, Azeri uh, leadership is smart enough to maintain a more balanced uh, foreign policy uh, B, uh, it's, it's in, because it's also in the interest of Azerbaijan uh, to have this more kind of uh, independent posture where it has both relations with Russia and Turkey. Uh, but it also, you ask whether Russia is concerned, I think Iran is extremely concerned uh, that its, relation, its, uh, its uh, presence and influence in uh, Azerbaijan may be waning uh, and that Turkish influence is growing. And is there Israeli influence is growing in that sense as well, right? Because uh, for obvious these complications that Iran and Israel have. So I think uh, for now uh, it's it's pretty well. If if there are concerns, they're rather mild in the sense that uh, Azerbaijan will maintain a more balanced uh, approach. Thanks. Um, Max, I'm now, I mean, I would have a lot more questions myself, but I want to put forward some of the questions that we have now in the chat box. Um, so first, a question for you, Asla, um, from Aris Dodtelis uh, Gavrilidia, who's asking, is, Turkey, is Turkish privileged relations with Russia compatible with Turkish membership in NATO, in particular in military procurement terms and more generally military policy? I think this has been the big biggest headache in Turkey's uh, in the Turkish American relationship Turkey's purchase of S 400s and growing relationship with Russia, I think uh, the sort of the competitive cooperation with Russia in Syria is well understood, as is Libya. Uh, where it gets tricky is is issues in which Turkey and Russia you get, is defense procurement issues, and I think the S four hundreds have led, uh, well, essentially two sets of sanctions. Uh, the, the, the one Turkey being excluded from the F thirty five fighter jet uh, production line and sales. And secondly, uh, CATSA sanctions have been imposed in Turkey, as you know, by the Trump administration at the 11th hour in December, uh, signaling, and the Biden administration is now signaling that somehow or another, uh, a, a solution, unless there's a solution for S-400s, uh, this relationship will continue to be rocky. I, I think that uh, while, you know, Turkey might, um, feel a geostrategic need to have a cozy, relation, better relations with Russia. When it comes to the political structures and institutions, its military, its traditions, and its, its actual uh, sort of a, a basically bureaucratic culture, it is nearly impossible to seek a divorce from NATO or um, uh, or the West. It is possible, of course, but very difficult. And I don't think that's really what they want. So there will be a desire on both sides. Uh, and this is something that's very important for NATO as well, uh, to first and foremost address the S-400 issue, which I, I'm going to talk about briefly, because I think there's a question about how S-400s can be, um, uh, you know, what, what kind of a solution there could be. Yesterday, we heard Turkey's chief of, uh, sorry, defense, uh, the defense minister, Hulusi Akar, former chief of staff, talking about a Crete formula in reference to the, what the, the formula that Americans have devised for the S-300s that Greeks had bought earlier, so for quite a while ago, actually. It's basically kept in storage. Uh, even, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know who holds the, the, the key, but it's not an active part of the Greek, uh, hard, you know, military hardware. And I think that 
at some point or, or another, this will be the option that's on the table for S400. Now, uh, Ma uh, Maxim maybe could tell us whether that's acceptable to Russia or not, but the idea would be for uh, Turkey not to activate the system. Uh, for public opinion purposes and to domestic audiences, Turkish officials will continue to say, well, we don't, we have it, we have the, bot uh, the you know, the, the, the start button and we'll activate it when we see a need, but in reality, that would be have to be a, a, a compromise solution with verification mechanism uh, uh, for the Americans to lift their existing CATSA sanctions on Turkey, which is starting to sink in. I think back in a, a year ago, two years ago, where, when S-400s were bought and Trump was in power, it was clear that President Trump would cut Turkey some slack on this sale and that uh, Turkey would not have have to face the sort of the more bitter, you know difficult consequences of this purchase. But now the tone is different. The tone in, is different in Congress, in Washington, and within NATO. And uh, you know, so the I, I do think Turkey will try to seek a compromise. Uh, whatever, no matter what language they use for domestic audiences, it will be, they can't do it in a way that upsets Russia, that is clear. So they cannot do the provisions that are called for in uh, NDAA, you know, by, by US Congress or CATSA sanctions bill, which essentially say send it back to Russia. That's not an option for Turkey. I think President Erdogan refuses that, but, you know, not plugging that in might have to be the only working formula. There are other issues between Turkey and, uh, and, and uh, NATO, obviously, that has to do with participation of Israel, UAE, in various operations and all. But I think over the next few years, we're going to see a big bit, sort of a, the effort on both sides by both Turkey and, and Washington to see if a reset is possible. I think the door is open in many ways for Turkey to re-enter, uh, and Turkey does not want to go back to the uh, to, to sort of to being a loyal ally of the transatlantic alliance. And that maxim is right in terms of the calculus in Washington. But this is not just a strategic matter. Also, you know, Turkish economy is very integrated with the Western economy, with European economy. It's political structures are, its political traditions are, uh, you know, while Erdogan and Putin are both very powerful leaders, there's a huge difference. Between, well, both are actually uh, experiencing some sort of a decline in popularity, it seems, but, but, but it's, it's, it means different things for Erdogan and Putin. In the case of uh, Erdogan, uh, the fact that he is electorally more and more vulnerable is essentially grounds for fixing the economy, improved relations with the West, trying to, because he, unlike, you know, he, he has to win elections to stay in power. And uh, despite the sort of the uh, illiberal turn in the country, it is still a very competitive electoral system here. And we've seen the opposition win across the country in local elections and that uh, in order not to see that uh, repeated in the general elections, President Erdogan will have to fix the economy. And the one thing that is clear is that Turkish markets, financial markets, investors, et cetera, they want better relations with the West. We can't hear you, Amanda. We can't hear you. Amanda, you're muted. Amanda, you are muted. Amanda, you are muted. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Apologies. Um, thank you, Asla. That was really, that was really a good analysis. I think I would like Maxim now to um to to comment on this on this same issue. You know, is a compromise possible? How would Russia, how would Russia receive a sort of compromise or accept a compromise on this? You know. Um, F-400, F-35 issue? Well, I, I'll be brief on this one. I think uh, whatever uh, Turkey and, and the West are going to negotiate is not really going to uh, hamper Russia's interests uh, as far as, you know, Turkey's concerned about fixing its own economy and its own standing. Uh, because as I, as I mentioned, you know, once they're sold, 
there's and again there's an issue it's not just a bunch of uh, military hardware that you sell there are Turkish military in, in, in officers in Russia for for the training to operate the S400 uh, you know if, if if the system is there then you know they, they will they will need people uh, who will be operating it so I don't think this uh, may be negotiable between uh, well it, it will be negotiable but I don't think Turkey is willing to give a lot uh, of compromise on, on this one. There's also an issue of, you know, the most important aspect of this deal is not just the, the, the stuff that Russia sold that Turkey bought, is the, the, the aspect of the co-production and co-sharing of some of the very sensitive technology uh, that, the, the, that the United States was not willing to share uh, on its missile production with Turkey that Russia said it was willing to share. But then there's some issues there, of course, there are bumps on the ground. Uh, but uh, the Russian military seems to be determined to go through with this contract. So I don't think uh, it's it's now for Russia to kind of have a say or a major uh, have a major impact on 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 this track. Uh, that's that's pretty much an issue between Turkey and, and, and the Americans. Can I ask a follow up question? Okay, thanks, thanks Max. Yes, go ahead, Asla. You can also ask a question. <laughs> to be very specific, uh, when you hear, when Russian officials hear of, uh, you know, a possibility that S-400 will not be activated, um, it, you know, you are, you're saying that that's not an issue that's between Turkey and United States, essentially. It's not something that uh, Russia will um, will uh, will be upset about uh, in its relations with Turkey. Well, the thing is, uh, there was a big debate whether whether the Russia should be selling S four hundred to Turkey in the first place, right? Because there was a big uh, chunk of the export community and some in the military who thought that you know all kinds of things that the Turkey may share this technology with West and, and Americans will know how the system operates. Others as well, and well, come on, Americans know this stuff already. Uh, the, uh, there were issues that Tur Turkey may use these uh, systems against the Russian aircraft in Syria and Libya and other places. So there was this. Uh, the, the decision was made upon kind of uh, cold blooded assessment that Russia is A, uh, selling an expert version of S 400. So that's not what its own military operates. So there, there are some of the things that are not in the system. Uh, and there's some of the sensitive technology that Russia is not going to share. The second thing is that S-400 is already, I would, I, I'm not going to say it's an old generation, but there's a new generation of S-500 that the Russian military is buying. So it's also in this sense is, uh, uh, again, uh, the third aspect, Russia has already had relations and, 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 and precedents of selling this uh, similar types of missile system to NATO countries, right, Greece, uh, you mentioned. So it's not just a, a super innovative or unprecedented deal that where Russia is selling some of the sensitive stuff to a NATO country. Uh, and, you know, basically the, the idea was that this is it because it's in the defensive system. Uh, it's uh, it's needed for Turkey for kind of its own diversification of its military and, and strategic posture from the Western uh, military. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, there was an also, also in this calculation that by selling this, Russia and Turkey are actually making an important step in expanding the cooperation on the military uh, technological uh, domain, which is potentially big. And you know, there were those discussions about potential purchase of Russian aircrafts and, and things like this. So, and then, yeah, to your question. Okay, I have a question. was Here, made. Yeah, just briefly, once this decision was made, all of these concerns were addressed. Uh, you know, it's it's over to you and then that's pretty much. Uh... Okay, thank you, thank you, Max. Um, I have a question here from Jose Taveras who's, who's commenting on um, Turkey's um, cooperation with Ukraine military, potential military cooperation. Um, what would be the consequences of perhaps Ukraine using the famous Turkish drones, would that not be a red line for Moscow? 
Now, I mean, Azerbaijan used a lot of Turkish drones and, and, and pretty much destroyed the, the, the military of the Russian treaty ally. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that uh, easily triggers Moscow off. Well, look, this idea I also saw one uh, question in their thread line, how Putin feels about the so-called neo-Ottomanism in Turkish. And I think this is a, a kind of a related theme in a, in a way in the sense that how Moscow sees these, these trends. Obviously, Ukraine has been an important uh, partner for Turkey and uh, Turkish officials would like to demonstratively go to Ukraine or do some deals when their relations with Russia are bad, right? You have an incident in Syria and then the next day some minister of Turkey will go to Ukraine and uh, talk that Turkey uh, condemns the Russia's occupation of Crimea, all of the things. So these kind of are headlines, they make news uh, for, for journalists, but they're not really something that uh, policymakers have uh, lose their sleep over. Because, and Putin was asked this question directly, actually, at, at the latest Valdai conference in December, and he, I think, had a very interesting answer. He said, uh, what I, he kind of ignored the, the, the part on uh, how Russia feels about Turkish neo-Ottoman ambitions and stuff like this. He said, what I care about is that Erdogan is a reliable partner and an, an independent partner. Uh, and he made a very specific case. He said, look, we can't really do a Nord Stream. We can build the Nord Stream 2. Uh, you know, Germany needs it, but they can't have an independent decision because of the American pressure. Uh, Turks have experienced this pressure when the Turkish stream was being considered and constructed, and they, you know, survived this pressure and they managed to get it because they need it. So he, it, it, it gives a sense that he appreciates uh, Erdogan's independence and, and, and that he can push for Turkish interests regardless of external pressure. Now, of course, oftentimes it poses risks and, and challenges for Russia itself. And this issue has been discussed across the Russian policymaking community. Uh, but th this is number one. And number two, he thinks that Erdogan is a predictable partner. And that's a very, very important thing. Even if, even he says that Turkey seeks to expand its influence and, and, and all these things to Putin, it's very important that it's this kind of, a, he's acting in a predictable manner so that his steps can be calculated. And it's not to say that he's, you know, he can easily play Erdogan. It's just that he really uh, thinks that if there is something on the table that is important for Turkey, he knows for sure that Erdogan will go for it. But that also gives ground for kinds of, you know, space for communication and cooperation and concessions for Russia. So I think Russia is not very much concerned that Turkey may supply some uh, military to Ukrainian stuff simply because it does not see uh, modern day Ukraine as a quote unquote independent state, but more reliable on and Western partners and, and, and Western uh, decisions. So Ukraine in this sense is more, and, and I hate to say, I don't, I don't, I don't wanna sound derogatory here, but it just again, from, from, the, from the perspective of the Russian leadership, Ukraine is not uh, an independent uh, player in, in this, in this uh, relationship. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Max. Um, we have a Karen uh, Knizel who has her hand raised, who has a question, if she's, if she's still there. Um, hello. hello, Karen. Yes, hello, Amanda. I'm still Please there. Please put your question. Yes. Uh, my question goes to both. Yes. Um, first of all, just hooking up on this pipeline issue. Um, do you see something like an energy alliance emerge because of Turk Stream? having replaced South Stream. Uh, pipelines are not built just for five years, a decade. Uh, it's really something that can build something like an alliance because uh, alliance partnership uh, were used uh, in, 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 in different ways. This is one thing. And the other thing is um, the notion of multipolar order. I know that it's a, it has an ideological connotation and on various places. I personally use it just in a historical sense. For me, 19th century was multipolar without any ideological connotation. Uh, but um, do Turkey and Russia, also with regard to China, view something like a multipolar uh, scene emerge? And on that also, where does China come in? China's Belt and Road Initiative, the railways, the, 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 the ports in the Eastern Mediterranean, touching upon um, Turkish... Um, territory influence. 
these would be the three elements. And thank you very much also to Amanda for having convened that. And I really enjoyed listening to, to all of you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Karin. Um, if I may, I would just like to um, put in one last question because I know we have to close in a few minutes. Um, I don't think we could leave this meeting without talking about the situation um, in, in Idlib um, and how you both view the ability of Russia and Turkey to maintain, let's say, the, the, careful, the, the careful balance um, in that part of Syria, you know, going forward, you know, is there going to be, could we perceive a sort of, you know, a bigger clash between the two? I mean, given what it seems like Turkey's policy of wanting to maintain um, its position there, um, perhaps for the long term, um, which sort of goes against, I would say, Russia's whole approach to Syria. How do you see the situation around Idlib now? So maybe I'll give the floor first to you, um, Asla, and then to, to you, Max. Let me start with Idlib. Um, I think while uh, people were often predicting tensions flaring up around Idlib, I have been thinking for some time that it is actually a sustainable arrangement between Turkey and Russia. Russians have uh, now control M4, and uh, which is what they wanted, and the rest they don't. They have made it Turkey's problem. And it is Turkey's problem now, uh, for good or bad, uh, meaning, uh, you know, managing not just a huge potential refugee flow and an instate, a Gaza Strip of sorts on its borders, but also having to live side by side with actors like um, HTS, uh, you know, various more uh, radical groups in the area. So uh, the current arrangement, I think, is seems to me uh, is acceptable to Russia. I think uh, that, um, you know, uh, this is what Idlib is important because what happened in Idlib and the ups and downs in the relationship last year has been a wake up call to Turkey. Uh, I mean, both Erdogan and Putin are cynical people and they're not in this for, uh, for, for uh, utopian notions, that's for sure. But I think it has really underlined the limits of the relationship to sort of there is, a, the, you know, what happened in Idlib when I'm referring to the event that Maxim has talked about, the targeting of Turkish uh, soldiers last year. It, it, since that point, yeah, we are right. seeking a bit of a more of a sober assessment from Turkey when it comes to Libya, uh, you know, when it comes to Idlib. Etc. And uh, uh, and I think that it, Idlib is important for that sense. It is also important because it is exactly the place where Russia holds a huge leverage over Tur Turkey. People have talked about the hierarchical nature of this relationship, the power imbalance. I think it's you know you know fine to talk about it, but but what matters is that Idlib is a huge card in terms of refugees that Russians have. While uh, you know uh, Turkey and Russia feel they benefit a lot from this relationship, and but Turkey feels it cannot cross paths with Russia. Uh, and about the pipeline issue, I mean, I think it's a similar line. Yes, Turkish stream, uh, you know, the, the, the more, more and more energy partnerships are great, but there, there came a point in Turkey in which reliance, over-reliance, dependence on Russia for energy, uh, for all types of energy needs came to be seen as a vulnerability. And I think now since over the past year or two, we've been seeing an effort to diversify more uh, both explorations in East Med and Black Sea. Turkey has increased its LNG imports. I think, yes, Turkey stream is built, but uh, you know, things have come to a standstill in, in, in the, in the, other projects. So uh, there is a need for balancing. In other words, I think Turkey wants good relations with Russia. And that, that wants a new world order, particularly Erdogan wants a new world order whereby the US supremacy is over, but Turkey is one of the great powers in the, in the great power game, etc. But he doesn't want to be a Russian vassal. And uh, I think both countries have enough historic memory uh, to know that there are limits, advantages, but also limits. 
and tread on each other on this territory very gingerly. Turkey is very careful when it does anything in the Caucasus uh, not to upset Russia. In Syria, very care in Libya, very careful not to upset Russia. It's not out of love, but more or because either side thinks this is going to grow into a full fledged alliance, but because um, I think, as Maximus pointed out, they also know that this can be a, this relationship has the cynical relationship, the cynical partnership has the ability to uh, to, to extract. Uh, heavy costs at times when things go south. Uh, so on the pipeline, my only sense is that, uh, uh, yes, multipolar scene, that's exactly what they strive for, but we are at a point in which Turkey does feel the need to also have, uh, to, to also to seek a balance uh, in its, uh, in its uh, external relations with other partners. Right. I'll just, yeah, can I? I know we're, we're running out of time. Just quickly, uh, a few things, uh, nothing I disagree about um, as far as Idlib is concerned. I will only say that uh, Turkish presence in the Northern Syria is, uh, lesser obviously problem for Russia than it is for Syria itself. So I think the more most difficult conversations are, are over, including over Idlib and the rest of the Northern Syria are not, well, they are about Moscow and Ankara, but also about Moscow and Damascus. Because right? Damascus is pushing for more uh, kind of forceful Russian action against uh, what they deem as Turkish occupation. And, and Turkey is actually using, I think, this moment into, you know, mounting local administrations and actually doing pretty good good job in, 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 re in restoring the infrastructure and many other things in northern Syria that in the long run help project and fortify Turkish influence in, in, in Syria. And it, like I said, uh, Russia has its own set of goals in Syria and, and these particular uh, movements by Turkey are not per se a threat to Russian interests, but they are a threat to, uh, to current uh, Syrian leadership and, and perhaps to, to Iran, but that's a, a separate set of uh, issues to discuss. On the pipelines, I think Russia has done a lot to actually uh, king make Turkey as a regional energy hub uh, in Eurasia. And I think Turkey has been extremely skillful in uh, turning its geography without you know, having substantial uh, energy resources, but turning its geography to work for, for, for its national interest and becoming an energy hub because all of the major energy projects running from Central Asia, from Russia, and possibly from the Middle East will have to go through Turkey. And that gives Turkey tremendous uh, leverage over energy markets in general and over Europe, over Russia, over Central Asia. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, I think, uh, important to bear in mind. On the multipolar world, uh, or what the latest trend in Russia has been to call it a polycentric world, because as they figured out there can only be two poles, <laughs> right? There can be multiple poles. Uh, the, in the polycentric world, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a concept, I think, and again, I'm not very familiar with, with the discussion on this issue in Turkey per se, but as far as Russia is concerned, I would say it is rather... Uh, what Russia, it is rather that Russia wants to see, as I mentioned, a more de-Westernized international system, right? It is more about what Russia uh, does not want to see than more about what it wants to see. And it does not want to see a US dominated world. Hence this concept of this polycentric multipolar world. But as we learn, even between Russia and Turkey clashes in Idlib and, 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 and Libya and other places, uh, in, and India-China clashes and many other things. This multipolar world, a polycentric world, is actually potentially a very dangerous place. You don't have a central organizing element. You know, more a system is more perhaps archaic, and, but also very countries who are arguing for this polycentric world have very very different approaches to this notion. Uh, you look at China, and China is arguing for a polycentric world but for monocentric Asia, where it dominates, something that makes Indians very unhappy, right? So there are many, many 
difficult elements to this concept, of course, I think. But one thing is clear, and I've mentioned that in my presentation a few times, that both Russia and Turkey seek to play a greater role in the international system and seek to see a, a more de-Westernized world Again, not because they hate the West or are against the West. Uh, Russia's and Turkey's history are closely interconnected with the West, both in positive and negative sense. But it's because they do not see themselves being recognized as part of the West over the past 20, 30 years, right? And, and that's why these kind of uh, ideas on what should work best, uh, nationalism, polycentricity, bilateral agreements against the West or beyond the West and all kinds of things. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll perhaps end here. Because the, the last question especially opened up a whole bunch of issues that we can go on forever, perhaps. Thank, thank you very much, um, Matt. I mean, one hour goes by very quickly, doesn't it? And I agree with you. I mean, all of these issues deserve to be, you know, given even a meeting to themselves. Um, but I would want to thank you both so much for coming here this morning and having this conversation. I think you were both brilliant. Um, your insights were, were great. Um, I certainly, you know, will leave this meeting, um, let's say, wiser from listening to the, to the both of you. Um, so, so thanks again. Um, I look forward to having you both back here again, you know, in the future, because EPC will continue to follow both Russia and Turkey independently, but Russia and Turkey together. Um, I would also like to thank the audience um, for joining us today and putting forward their questions. They were very much welcomed. And all remains for me to say is I wish you all um, a very good afternoon and a good remainder of, of the week. So thanks, thanks to you all again and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.